Welcome to today's webinar, Evaluating School Principals from the Maryland State House to the Schoolhouse, brought to you by NCSL. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode to provide favorable sound quality during today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Michelle Ekstrom. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Ekstrom, and I'm Education Program Director at the National Conference of State Legislatures. I welcome you to our webinar, Evaluating School Principals from the Maryland State House to the School House, co-sponsored by the National Conference of State Legislatures, the National Governors Association, the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the Wallace Foundation. I want to thank you, thank our co-sponsors and the foundation for supporting this effort, and thank you for joining us. Today, participants will learn and discuss the research base on principal evaluation, best practices, and lessons learned, Maryland's experience in developing and implementing a statewide principal and evaluation system, and Prince George's County's experience as a pilot district and implementation at the district and school levels. I also want to point you to two excellent resources recently published on this topic. The first is called Districts Matter, Cultivating the Principal's Urban Schools, ne Urban Schools Need. This is published by the Wallace Foundation. And the second is called Evaluating School Principals, a Legislative Approach. This is written by Sarah Shelton at the National Conference of State Legislatures. I will have links for these for you at the close of the webinar. And you can access both of these publications from our newly redesigned website. Visit the School Leaders page from our Education Research page to find these and other helpful resources and news on this topic. Today our presenters include Joe Murphy, Professor of Education at the Vanderbilt Peabody College of Education, David Volrath, Teacher and Principal Evaluation Planning and Development Officer at the Maryland State Department of Education, and Douglas Anthony, Director in the Office of Human Capital Management at Prince George's County Public Schools in Maryland. There will be time for question and answers at the end of the webinar. Please remember to type in your questions via the chat. So we will begin with Joe Murphy. Joe is the Frank W. Mayborn Chair of Education and Associate Dean at Peabody College of Education at Vanderbilt University. He has also been a faculty member at the University of Illinois and the Ohio State University, where he was the William Ray Flesher Professor of Education. In the public schools, he has served as an administrator at the school, district, and state levels. His work in the area of school improvement was best with special emphasis on school leadership and policy. Joe, thanks for joining us, and I will turn it over to you at this point. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Um, nice looking picture you've got up there. I like that. <laughs> um, all right, I want to set the stage. I want to talk about uh, three or four or five things, uh, and I know I only have three hours, so I want to try to get it in. It's a joke. Um, so the, the first thing I want to say and be clear about is the effort to improve the quality of leadership at the school level is, is a multi-task activity. No one's going to ratchet up the quality of leadership simply by uh, evaluating their principles better. Um, it's like good schooling. You need There's about five or six or seven pieces of the puzzle that need to be brought to the table, and then they need to be integrated and coordinated and linked in thoughtful ways in order to get uh, purchase on stronger uh, leadership. So you, you would need to do things around um, the preparation of uh, school leaders, the ongoing development and training of school leaders, issues of governance and incentives, um, things around accreditation of preparation programs and, and and so on and so on. So it really is, I want to be clear that it's going to require a lot of state effort around the number of leverage points all working in the same direction to be successful. So that's sort of my opening gambit, if you will. The second thing I thought I would talk just a second about are the problems with the current evaluation systems that we have in the country. 
country or have had for the past, um, um, really pretty much for the last 30 or 40 years, if you will, until the recent era of, uh, of reform. Uh, and the probably the most troublesome thing that we know when we study these systems are that uh, they don't tend to zero in on the things that actually make a difference in whether students learn or not. So evaluation systems are, um, they cover a lot of ground, they touch on a lot of things, but they don't highlight or emphasize what we would call um, the variables or the quality, the variables or the conditions that principals can actually leverage to make a difference in student performance. So if you're not evaluating on the right stuff, then you've got a problem. And principal evaluation is historically not evaluated on the right stuff. The second um, major problem we have here is the process, and that is it's, it's been a very limited uh, architecture or scaffolding to use to evaluate um, school principals. Uh, it perfunctory comes to mind. It's historically not been a deep process, been very limited, often emphasizing one kind of data um, thrown together at the last minute um, in order to meet personnel deadlines, but not an, in any stretch of the imagination a thoughtful and well-developed process integrating multiple criteria to come to really important um, decisions. And so if we have a problem with content, we have a problem with process. The third thing is principal evaluation historically has had almost no impact on anything of importance. So uh, it, it doesn't provide useful feedback to principals. It certainly has not been linked to professional growth and development of principals. There's no sense of driving organizational or school improvement. And there's almost histor historically there's been almost no linkage to uh, the kinds of changes you would want to see in, for kids and behavior. So, so what we have here, when you cut to the chase, is a is a system that doesn't evaluate much of use, does it in a pretty weak way, and doesn't have an impact. So th that's the bad news. The good news is that leaves a lot of room for improvement. And if you look, start to look out from there and you look at the places that have made a difference, and, and I don't, I'm not going to slight people here because lots of places have done things that I don't know. I'll just pick up some of the, that I do know. Um, on the state level, um, Ohio, Delaware, New York, Illinois, Kentucky, um, I think have done some, some interesting work. I understand Maryland is in the same, the same boat, although I'm not quite as familiar with that. Um, and what you find here is that most of these systems are grounded on a set of principles, P-I-L-E-S, that spell out what's valued. Um, so there's no there's no loss on that. So you say, well, the, the system should value the behaviors that principals undertake that make a difference in what teachers do, right? Well, that that begins to narrow down what you're going to focus on. And districts have trouble with that because when you focus on something, you oftentimes you don't focus on something else. But unless you're willing to put on the table what are the most important things, um, you you just run into a big notebook of stuff that has, has no meaning. So that's one thing we know. We know that all of these states have developed systems that are built around multiple components. So it's not just one thing. It's not just the goal for the year or whatever. It's, it's usually goals, some student achievement data, usually a pretty direct measure of principal behavior, again, around the things that make a difference uh, for teachers and kids, oftentimes around uh, a professional growth goal and sometimes even around measures of customer satisfaction, uh, which would be parents mostly in this case. So they build their evaluation system around three to five major components, um, and that and they, they spread it out over that. And they get, they get I think, um, um, deeper content in their evaluation. They're also much more strategic about um, the, the, the um, process by which they do the evaluation. We tell districts, you know, if your principals get bad evaluations, the first 
question is, what the hell did the district know and what did you do about it? So the problem is not on the back of the principal, it's on the district. Um, and I think that's an accurate way uh, to look at it. It should be a process where uh, supervisors and principals are engaged in a mutual struggle for improvement at the school level. And that, that really, I think, is the, the essence of the process. And, so, and some of these states have got it, I think, pretty close. And then the last thing I want to say is uh, it, it all anchors on what you decide is worth assessing. And we know that student achievement is explained by five or six things. And the question, and those five or six things are not a surprise to anybody. They are the, the quality of the instruction in the school, the rigor, uh, uh, meaningfulness, and uh, of the uh, curriculum, the sense of data and the monitoring and the use of that data to make important decisions, the pastoral care for kids, communities of deep practice for teachers and powerful linkages to communities. These are the six things that actually explain whether kids, why some kids learn in schools and others don't. So if you want to get a principal evaluation system, you have to privilege those six things in the evaluation system. And that's very difficult for some people to do because they want to measure everything a principal can possibly do. And I think our argument keeps coming back to Yes, principals make 1,200 decisions a day. We know that. But you've got to evaluate them on those things that make a real difference in what happens in classrooms and what happens to kids. For us, uh, we talk about that as learning-centered leadership. We've, we've talked about that for about 30 years. I would also say that you know certainly the national standards, the ISLIC standards, scaffold those six ideas uh, quite nicely. So having a ground around which this whole system works is is particularly important. So that that's my 13 minute presentation and I look forward to questions and uh, discussion as we move forward. Thanks Joe, that was really helpful. Um, it set a really good context for the remainder of the uh, of the webinar. Can I uh, follow up briefly with a, a quick question? Can you talk a, a little bit about Valed, why it was developed, some key components, where it's being used, and what are the results? Yes, I, I would say this. Valed, um, you know, if you're going to put a system together and you want components, so you want a component on, you know, outcomes in terms of whether students learn. I think that's, that's fair uh, and appropriate. But you also want to measure how well principals are doing the things that they're supposed to do that make a difference for kids. And that's where ValEd comes in. It assesses the instructional leadership of principals in schools, um, and it collects that information from three sources, from the principal herself or himself, from the supervisor, and from all the teachers in the school. So you have this sort of triangulation about how well a principal is doing, say, on aligning the regular curriculum and the special ed curriculum, or ensuring that every child in the school is known and cared for. So we get, we get assessment measures of those processes, and ValEd does that. Um, it's it's uh, uh, reliable and valid in a statistical sense, which is important, I think, if you're going to use it for high-stakes purposes, such as principal evaluation. Uh, right now, it's in about 5,000 schools, 5% 5 of the schools in the country, I guess, something like that. Um, we have a big grant from IES, but we have not, um, we have not answered the, the question yet about the correlation between the ValEd and uh, sort of value-added measures of student learning, but we're, 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 on, uh, we're on the quest. Great, thank you. So next we're going to hear from Dave Volrath. Dave has worked with the Department of Education in Maryland since 2011 after a lengthy career in Hartford County Public Schools. His current work for the state superintendent is to ensure that Race to the Top projects related to teacher and principal evaluation are properly implemented. His education career includes practitioner experience as a teacher, coach, administrator, and district executive administrator, and he has presented nationally on such diverse topics as secondary school reform, high school facility design, and college and career education. So today, Dave will provide some background and context for teacher and principal evaluation in Maryland. 
highlight the process at the state level, discuss some of the nuts and bolts, and walk through the implementation to date, including the federal waivers. So welcome, Dave. Thank you. Um, when Sarah asked me to join the webinar, she specifically said, um, provide some examples that people can see of how Maryland went about doing this work in the last year and where Maryland currently is and a little bit about maybe where Maryland's going. So I'm going to use a number of slides. People can take them with them later and look at them a little more closely if they choose to. But it will help tell the story a little bit about how we go about this work. There were, when we began our work here in Maryland, there were three pieces policy-wise that were kind of playing into this simultaneously. And there was that piece that had to do with the Education Reform Act here in 2010. Uh, that applied to all of our LEAs. If you're not familiar with Maryland, we only have 24 of them. Uh, unfortunately, some are very big, as in enormous, and others are actually quite small. So their political positioning amongst themselves is very, very different. Some have a lot of clout. Some have, have a lot less, and we have to advocate for them a little bit more. But all the LEAs had to conform with what was in the Education Reform Act. Um, all of our LEAs had to conform with whatever was in our existing um, ESEA flexibility waiver. But only 22 of the 24 who signed on for Race to the Top were bound by the Race to the Top expectations. So if you looked at it, it would be, it would be kind of like this. Uh, these are the things that everybody in our state has to buy into. It's very similar to what you would see in other states. But you can see that there's not a lot of definition in here. And probably the, the most significant wording in here exists in the phrase where it talks about uh, significant measures of student growth or significant component. Because as you know, significant doesn't have much value in terms of uh, quantitative measure. So the ongoing debate from day one has been, how would we define um, significant in this case? With the flexibility waiver, one of the problems we ran in policy-wise was that there were pieces written into the flexibility waiver that really um, held sway over what would eventually be the race of the top work that we were doing, the, the application. So when you look into our flexibility waiver, you would see that the state testing and reading and math, which is MSA in our, in our state, um, exists in the waiver as a 20% measure of evaluation. So when we began the work of race at the top, we had to actually conform to that standard, even though we hadn't really done any of the work at that point. Um, we also uh, made some commitments to using student learning objectives early on at a point in time when they were just emerging, knowing full well that we really didn't know a lot about how we were going to make use of those things. And then the third part is the part for those people who signed on for race that are the top in our district. And you can see some of the things that we built into our, our, our application and in the work that we've done, things about how we define annual, um, how we went about um, developing a local model in our state um, you, have, uh, you have an option in your local um, LEA. The state provides um, what was originally called a default model. We didn't particularly like the word default. It sounded kind of negative. So instead, we created eventually what, was, what became known as a state model. Um, and all the locals have to divine, the, design their local models within a, a, a bigger uh, parameter that's in the state model, which you'll see in just a second. Um, they also had to come to some agreement with their local LEAs to get this work uh, accomplished. So you can see those pieces in there. And then the, the biggest difference here is when you got to the race at the top, you can clearly see there is a quantitative measure listed for student growth. And in this case, it was 50%. We also used a, an additional process to help us along. The governor uh, put together a a, an advisory committee, which became known as the Maryland Council on Educator Effectiveness. And it, and it comprised about 35, 40 people from all walks of the world, politics, business, private sector, uh, higher education, um, LEAs, folks like that, uh, who have been meeting since December of 2010 to provide feedback on this process. They meet every six months. So we've been using this this council is really a sounding board for the work that we're doing. Um, while they really don't have sway over our work, their, their advice obviously is critical because they represent a lot of 
particular groups. That group finally completed its work to satisfaction um, in December uh, just a few weeks ago. So when you look at the next slide, what you're seeing here is how the state model eventually emerged. So you can see, for instance, well, we'll go out the pointer. You can see that there's a 50% growth measure as well as a 50% uh, quantitative measure. Maryland already had in place eight measures for instructional leadership for principals. You see them on the top left where it says the Maryland Instructional Leadership Framework. Um, those, those were already in existence here, and they have measures and indicators that we use in that regard. Um, but they were written originally around instructional leadership. So as we began to build a model, it became very clear there were other elements beyond just instruction that were going to impact a principal's evaluation. Certainly there were some that were pretty critical. Um, so we turned to ISLIC to provide for the state model for additional domains that we add. So when you look at the state model, there are actually 12 measures that we use in the state model, and that 50% of our measure has a variable value. You can see up in that box it says 12 domains, 2 to 10% each. The principal in consultation with his supervisor or his evaluator can craft value measures from 2 to 10% for these 12 measures so that the things that are valued with a brand new principal uh, might carry a different weight than maybe a, a principal of several years experience. We thought that was a critical piece. Our state association liked that approach. At the bottom of the page, you can see how the student growth measures are factored in. There are a 20% test measure lag data piece that we try to apply to all of our, of our principals. Um, there's a 10% school progress index that you see listed there. Uh, that comes out of our, um, our um, accountability measure for school accountability. Um, I would tell you that, that we don't use that in, in the teacher model at this time, but we believe it is an act, it, it's been pretty much accepted as an accurate reflection of the, of the principal's role. And then we've also gravitated towards using uh, student learning objectives as yet another measure, both in our principal and teacher evaluations, and you can see the values that we eventually arrived at. So if, if you were to wonder, well, how will that look different for a state, for a local LEA's model, this is a typical, the overall pattern for a local model. And you can see the biggest difference is they can choose how to craft these additional domains as they see fit. They may have one, uh, domains that they value locally beyond the four that we might have added, or they may choose to configure them differently. Um, they still have to eventually arrive at a 50% at a composite measure, and they can set those percents how they believe best suit their local needs. You can also see down the bottom where, where the use of the percentages for the student growth uh, have a lot more flexibility in them and a lot more opportunity to move uh, either local objectives or local measures or um, student growth measures other than just SLOs that, that suit the local interests. Um, they even have the option to, to, to uh, and you'll hear this later from Prince George's, to ramp up this over a period of time. The biggest shift here, though, for us uh, in working with our principals, uh, because we have signed on to this as a developmental process, we've really stayed away from the issue of accountability. This is about helping principals develop the leadership skills they need uh, to run schools and be effective school leaders. So we've had to shift the thinking away from this annual event to an ongoing event. So when you look at this donut that's on here right now, you can see how different pieces of this evaluation can actually be accomplished throughout the year, and we actually recommend that people do it this way because the lag, use of lag data makes a lot more sense to people if they're continuously thinking in this fashion. We started out with four questions. They're pretty easy. They go back three years. Do you think we can measure student growth? We do and we've tried to measure it for principals in two ways. There is a, a local index that we developed to apply to our reading and math test. It measures the change in cell values for, for, for uh, each student, and then those uh, changes can be put together collectively for a teacher. In this case, it would be the composite change of student values for the entire school population for the principal. The second growth measure, as I said, is based on SLOs. This is something that we are really working on, warp speed, 
uh, our teachers have really, and principals have really embraced this measure because it's one that they understand. It relates to the work they do. They have input into setting the targets, but more importantly, the principal can use this particular measure uh, to tie in the interest of a school improvement plan, the interest of certain uh, gap reduction uh, uh, targets that they might have. It's a much more school and personal approach to the measures that, that they've gravitated towards. The next question for us was always, if we do this, can we connect it to the people who are responsible for the work? You can see in the case of principals, uh, all the students count towards that principal. We do allow some flexibility and attribution so that we're only looking at the kids who are most representative of having been in the school and the work that's taken place by the teacher and the principal. So we don't waste a lot of time counting kids who were not present uh, an adequate amount of time to participate in what we're trying to discover about either the teacher's ability to teach or the principal's ability to lead. But we also realize that a high absentee rate could be a different issue that would show up somewhere else in the principal's uh, evaluation. It does use a school-wide cumulative uh, collective accountability measure and also the student learning objectives. The next question became, of course, if we do this and we associate these measures to the principal, how are we going to make it fair? Um, we believe that the 50% that the professional practice provides an, an element that the principals have great control over in this domain, along with the SLO, so they can control the fairness issue within the design of the measures that they craft with their supervisors. Uh, it does require a rating for everyone. You can see in Maryland we only have two, two, uh, uh, two requirements. You have to hold an administrator one certificate and you have to demonstrate that you've been appropriately trained if you're using the state model we provide it or if you're using the local model um, the, lo uh, the local has to provide that. We currently at the state do not have a plan for certifying or calibrating principal. That's a local prerogative. We did run some field tests in the spring. You can see some of the results here. In particular for the principals, about 20% of our principals were rated last year. You can see how the ratings fell out. Uh, we're not here to, we really haven't passed judgment on this. It's a small sampling. We'll do every one this year and have a better idea. But we were encouraged, quite frankly, by the distribution we saw with our teachers. So if you're looking at teachers as well, that's something that might play into this. And in the end, if we do all these things, will it actually make a difference? Well, there's a couple things that we believe. We believe that if we continue to respect the autonomy of our districts and work with them within their own model frameworks, um, because in the end their models look very much like ours, we believe that has the greatest potential for success. Uh, continuing to be sensitive to the workload issue, principals have told us repeatedly, boy, this is a lot of work, and if you don't have a plan for distributing the work and you don't start from day one thinking strategically about how to get the year's work done, it will probably compound itself before the end of the year. Um, to be sensitive, to make sure that the right kids are counted to the right people, follow what the data tells you. And when it tells you you're going in the wrong direction, make a change. Go in a different direction. Use it to inform yourself. Uh, dedicate your resources. Have a communication plan. Remain committed to evaluation as, a, as an improvement tool. We really believe this. This is what this is about. It's not about accountability. It's about improving teacher and principal performance. You should work on your spelling in the next one. If you're me, that should say maintain patience. It takes a lot of time to do this work, and everybody has to just be patient and willing to slow down. And most importantly, commit to preparing people to do the work. Make sure that they're getting what they need to accomplish the mission. You can see all of our work right now has navigated towards strategic delivery of professional development. Uh, our first year was about professional practice and making sure people were comfortable there. Our second year was really about model development. Our third year is about the PD to do the work. And you can see we deliver our PD to our, to our folks in five cycles this year. It includes training for uh, our executive officers who train our principals as well as the professional development people who train our principals and our teachers in their districts. Um, one of the downfalls, and this is just a sample of the design that we're using in each of these spheres, and you can see in the second box uh, that one of the audiences we have, um, or actually the first two boxes, audiences we have access to, one of the things we have to struggle with is we don't have direct access to principals and teachers in this state the way you would in a statewide uh, model. 
So we have to work really hard through other layers uh, and develop accountabilities to make sure those things are occurring. Um, we do train our executive officers. You can see examples here of some of the things that we work with our executive officers on this year in their training. And you can also see what some of the outcomes are that we're looking for for our executive officers. Maryland's one of those unique states. Executive officers in Maryland are, by definition, people who evaluate principles. So it could be a person who's an executive officer in a district. In some districts, it's actually the superintendent that is doing this work. So it makes for an interesting dynamic to try and reach those audiences to work on these particular goals. And then we come to where we are, and that is, what are we going to do about extending the flexibility waiver now that's been offered? Um, are we going to make additional amendments to that waiver if it's accepted to make further changes? The merging role of higher ed, we, we, have to fig we have to take the next step, which ensures that the people coming into the profession are equally trained to do the work in their preparation programs. This whole issue of transitioning, what are we going to do in the absence of growth measures for two years? We got to have a plan for that. How are we going to maintain a, uh, the, the correct public message and stay on it as a state and as 24 separate LEAs? And then most importantly, this whole issue of concurrently integrating Common Core with evaluation and either the park assessment or the smarter balanced assessment. These are things that really need attention at this point in time. Okay. Thanks, Dave. That was great. I know lots of states are right in the middle of this, so it's really fascinating to hear the work that you're doing. So next we're going to hear from Douglas Anthony. Douglas uh, serves as the Executive Director of the Office of Talent Development for the Prince George's County Public School System. He is charged with providing leadership and oversight of the system's efforts in building leadership capacity for all employee groups, including administrators, teachers, central office, and support personnel. His work includes supporting the development of a robust, viable pipeline of teachers and administrators using research-based methods, along with the performance appraisal and talent development process that maximizes employee effectiveness. Doug is going to talk about Prince George's County's principal evaluation systems, including their experience as one of the statewide pilot districts their use of surveys to measure principal's practice, and successes and challenges to date. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. So I think Dave did a great job at identifying um, the process in the state of Maryland. He's been instrumental in helping us as a district uh, move this process forward. And so um, I hopefully will echo and um, support the, some of the information that Dave has already presented by giving you a local context for some of the work we've done within the district. And so the first uh, slide I really wanted to point out is really just a frame of reference for me um, to talk a little bit about the evolution. I think what's significant, and, and Dave mentioned the Educational Reform Act 2010 um, and the impact that uh, we had as a district, we started as um, a pilot district not only for this work in terms of principal evaluation, but also for teacher evaluation in the state. We were fortunate to receive um, a teacher incentive fund as well as a Gates grant that helped inform our work um, in our early stages of our teacher evaluation, which had an impact obviously on principal evaluation at the time. And so at that particular point in period in time was also um, a principal. And at this time we called the program FIRST. Um, and the FIRST program really helped um, look at a paper performance model in the district. Um, and really gave us a sense of how to approach building capacity within the district. Uh, Dave mentioned that the whole important piece of this is to really help people get better at their practice and to build capacity of administrators. So that initial work, I think, informed us being um, very interested in, one, being a pilot district within the state, uh, as well as just continuing to uh, learn from that experience to be better informed for how we move forward with the principal evaluation work in the district. So in this slide, you'll see that, you know, it has a, we established the PD and evaluation task force early on. We had all the stakeholders that you see under that, central office, school principals, teachers, and, and the union, we really worked hand in hand to devise and develop uh, a comprehensive approach to uh, evaluation in our district initially. And through that experience, it really informed um, some of the missteps 
uh, or help us to avoid some of the missteps we took early on in this process. And so our process as a pilot district this year has been um, um, the year before, the previous years has been very helpful for us to uh, learn from not only our work but from working with the State Department who would send out regular correspondence, hold regular meetings with representatives from each of the um, LEAs, and, and we continue to kind of um, hone and, and grapple and, and struggle with everything from the student learning objectives um, to really what are we going to account for in terms of student measures. On the next slide, you'll see uh, Dave gave you the what we call used to call the default model, and this is the model that Prince George's County um, is using, and it's tied directly to our leader standards in the district. And so, the eight elements that are uh, under the professional practice uh, are aligned nicely with our leader standards, which include both the ISLIC standards and the Maryland Instruction, um, Instructional Leadership Framework. And we worked in partnership in developing um, our leader standards so that there was an alignment when we um, developed the new evaluation process. And of course, there's very specific indicators that support each of those uh, identified areas. And so professional practice became um, part of uh, our overall uh, scope of work relative to the evaluation process. And then the other side, of course, is the student growth measures. And we, again, we talked about student learning objectives. In fact, it's an ongoing process. So I guess the other thing is to just understand from a local standpoint, um, this is, uh, this is um, us full-fledged now into the evaluation process, but it's always a learning process. So we're continually to do training. We're accessing training that the state provides. We're, I'm, I'm in a building right now where we're currently doing um, um, SLO training for our new assistant principals and principals who have come on board as well just to continue to reinforce and grapple with what that looks like. And so that context for continuing to, to build the next stages and to have everyone um, aligned and calibrated is extremely important. And so some of the efforts in the district have been um, strategically around designing opportunities for principals to calibrate themselves, for principal supervisors to calibrate themselves in terms of how to handle uh, a principal evaluation and to support them in the development of that um, and making sure that all of the district uh, were connected to leadership capacities tied to those standards. If you look, look at the next slide here, it gives you the student growth measures uh, information that we um, hinge our work on currently. And again, the student learning objectives have been a critical point for us in helping align our student improvement plan work to help schools and principals have um, conversations with staff so there's uniformity in some of these aspects while being able to differentiate it for specific teachers. Um, of course, attendance is a part of that work. The state assessments, and as Dave indicated, one of the things that I know we're, we're continuing to, to think forward and, and work with the state on is thinking through, you know, the uh, implementation of Common Core as well as the park assessments and how do we make sure that that's reflected not only in the overall evaluation, but more importantly, how is it part of the, evaluate, the observation process throughout the year? And so we've spent a lot of time and energy and continue to put uh, resources around helping principals get better at showing the alignment of all the different system initiatives and all the state requirements so that there's a connectivity across the, the work and that there doesn't seem like we're just adding another thing to do, but how all and each of these things are related becomes critically important moving forward. Also on here you'll see, and Joe talked about Valed, and Valet is a, a very um, useful instrument for us. And, and in terms of some of the things that we've done with Valet in our district is that we actually piloted Valet as part of um, our assistant principal training. One of the things that I wanted to do was to identify gaps uh, across our assistant principal candidate pool since they're the next um, bench for our principal candidacies and vacancies. And so I thought it was important that we find a way and use Valed as, as, a, as a, a formative assessment to really help us understand where there are gaps. And Valed does a great job at providing a context. Again, our evaluation system, our leader standards, all of it is connected and aligned and supports um, how Valed outlines its co core competencies and their key processes. And just having a conversation yesterday with an assistant principal who became a principal in the last two months, 
she indicated that in her training, um, the, the connections to external communities, which is one of those core competencies in Valed, was something that she felt she didn't have enough support in. And so it's really helping us inform the type of training and professional development that we have um, for our um, assistant principals as well as principals. And so we continue to learn um, from that, those tools as well. I think as a pilot district, one of the things that we learned is that, one, you have to be extremely uh, conscientious and intentional about making sure all stakeholder groups are involved and that you have to make sure that there's uh, opportunities um, for unions and, and um, again, other key stakeholders to be available and transparent about the process so that when you implement and introduce and call for training and ask um, um, groups to get together to really discuss the work that there's an opportunity to do that. I would also say what's extremely is import, important moving forward is continuing to leverage the state um, the State Department and uh, the offerings and opportunities that they have. They've been very helpful to my team. We've been fortunate this year to actually um, beef up the support within our district to have an office now fully um, staffed and aligned to support the implementation of um, evaluation for all employee groups. And so this will probably be one of my last <laughs> webinars relative to having a new director involved to specifically help um, initiate, initiate and continue to implement the work within um, the district. But um, again, I think it's just a collective effort that we've been um, happy to be a part of and we've learned um, a lot in the last uh, several years around this work. So I'll end it there and turn it back over to the team. Great. Thank you so much. This has been great to have an overview of the research and to hear both the state and district perspective on implementation. So now we have a few questions that have been posted that I will post to our speakers, but I do encourage you to go ahead and type in any questions you might have into your chat feature on the right side of your screen, um, and I will pose those questions to our speakers. So the first question is, um, can you please review the six things that matter for student achievement? And I think this question goes back to Joe Murphy. Um, the person who posed the question said, I didn't hear anything about student socioeconomic background. How should student backgrounds be factored into principal evaluations? So Joe, yeah. can you answer that one? It's a big question, but so yeah, let me let me let me let me be clear. Schools explain about 25 or 30 percent of student learning, so the other 70 percent is explained outside of school. So we just take that as a given and focus on the part that we can can get control on. So the you always want to control for socioeconomic status um, and race. And so forth. When you, if you're going to do any value-added measures of student achievement, for sure, um, or we just don't get comparable data. So I would say, yes, you want to control, um, but yes, schools need to focus on what they can do. Um, they can change a lot of things. They can't change um, income levels of parents in front of their kids, though. So that's a given. Now, the six things are, you know, you guys have them. They're, they're the same six things that are in the ISLIC standards or the same, the national standards. They are quality of instruction, rigor and meaningfulness of the, of the curriculum, um, a sense of, a powerful sense of using and monitoring what's going on and using data to make decisions about where you want to get better. Um, Pastoral, strong pastoral care for kids. All kids are known, cared for, respected, have ownership in the company, you know, opportunity to participate. Uh, fifth would be powerful learning communities for adults in the building, for teachers. Um, and, the, and the last, I think, would be um, uh, really robust and meaningful engagement with parents, so not PR, not just involvement, but what you know, really meaningful engagement, and those those are the things that you know, by and large, explain student learning. So you want to focus on those things for sure. Great, thank you. We have another question. Um, do you recommend that the quantitative portion of principal evaluation focus 100% on growth? And I think this question could go to um, to any of the three of you. Go ahead, guys. 
Well, there's a lot of opinions about about this piece and, and how to measure the quantitative, what the quantitative measures might be. My personal opinion would be that um, that it should be 100% related to student growth. Um, I'm not a big fan of the standards-based approach. I think that, that uh, it, it discourages teachers who teach more challenging students and the growth models that are out there can allow it to be more fair for, for uh, teachers and principals. And I also think if, if you have a concern about the percentage of value of student growth, um, just lower the percentage of the value in the instrument rather than the components within it. I would agree with that. I think that makes perfect sense. The, the, the question, the, the real issue is, you know, stop, don't use value added. I mean, let's just go back to normal terms like human beings, and that's a measure of growth, right? So and you don't need state tests to measure growth. You can measure growth. You have a, lots and lots of assessments that you're doing on your kids to measure growth. So there are lots of opportunities to look at growth in kids. And you also have different benchmarks. If you're in a school where kids are making six months growth every year, then, you know, to go to a full year's growth is, is a magnificent accomplishment, right? Um, so you have growth, yes, multiple measures to determine whether kids are growing or not, and then sensible attention to the benchmarks that you, that you use to determine the growth. Yeah, I, I would I would concur. I think uh, what's significant is thinking about the complexity and the variations that you have in local schools. And so, um, I was a principal of a, a pretty diverse school, had the largest special education population um, within the district. And taking kids who were nonverbal to be verbal in one year um, is a significant uh, achievement that might not be caught any other way um, than than um, well, maybe not caught any other way, but it's a significant achievement that's not always captured in the data that's collected. And so I think um, both Joe and Dave hit it right on the head. It's it's being intentional and strategic about how we're measuring growth over time for all employees that, for that matter, um, are in front of children each day. And the other thing that you guys said I need to be reinforced is these are not universal benchmarks. What 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 is acceptable and good? What is a good score for a principal you just assigned to a turnaround school? Right. Be considerably different than what it Correct. is in a more advantaged elementary school. I mean, the point here is to establish targets and benchmarks based on the context in the school in which the principal works. I'd agree. Absolutely. So I have a. A question about measuring growth. Uh, during our fall forum last week, we had some conversation about envisioning new accountability systems where perhaps we don't have summative year-end assessments. Um, and then legislators were trying to envision a system where we would measure growth without those summative uh, yearly assessments. So I'm curious if in Maryland, um, Dave or Doug, if you, if there's any school districts who are able to feed formative assessment results into your growth model, or if you know of any states who are doing that? Well, I'd like to say that, yeah, we figured it out, but I can, <laughs> the truth is we haven't. Um, but we've made a, a commitment to using the, um, the student learning objective process to try and figure out a way to do some of that that work. We haven't completely thrown out the test score translations. We understand that, that they're they're really out there and we have to use them at some point. Um, but it could, in, in, in a perfect world, if we were to find ways to use the SLOs that were measurable and made sense for each teacher and the kids who sat in front of that teacher each day or to each principal and the kids that attended his particular school, that would be a far more powerful motivator than a rote test score that's translated into a percent in somebody's evaluation because it really doesn't tell you a little bit about what you have to do to change the performance in any way. It's, it's just an accountability measure. And like I said, our, our approach has been we've stayed away from accountability. We really are committed that this is a developmental instrument that helps people improve their performance over time. That's what we're trying to do. Great, thank you. 
So just as a reminder, if you have any questions, you can be sure to or go ahead and type those into the chat function, um, and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Just one last parting thought from each of you. If there's one takeaway for state legislators and legislative staff, one piece of advice that you would give, could you please offer that at this point? Sounds like a David question. <laughs> yeah, I was afraid you were going to say that, too. <laughs> um, one piece of advice that I would offer legislators, I guess it would be take the time to be <clears throat> accurately informed. It's so easy to allow um, folks who are on a tangent to try and, and monopolize the conversation for the wrong reasons. I think you really do need to take the time to do your homework, have your folks do the research, and make sure that what people are um, presenting as fact is truly factual information and not lose sight of what we're all about, and that's increased rigor for kids and, and increased performance levels for teachers and principals. Yeah, I would. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I would I would echo uh, Dave's sentiments. I think it's really important to get um, context and understand that um, at the heart of the matter is how are we improving our practices to, to benefit children, and in each context that may be something different. And so being able to provide some structure and some benchmarks and um, some uniformity to, to some extent in approach is really important, but more important is being able to understand the context of each school and how they're defining how they're um, working through meeting the needs of the students of that particular school. And so um, I would just uh, concur and echo Dave's sentiments. Great. Thank you. Well, on your screen, you have contact information for Sarah, for Sarah Shelton. She oversees our work on school leadership, so please be sure to contact her if you have any follow-up questions. Also, there is the website for more information generally on school principals as well. And I would thank our presenters. We really appreciate you spending time with us and to share your expertise with legislators and legislative staff. Also, a reminder that you can access the slides and audio from this webinar from our website as well. And on this last screen, I wanted to again highlight two publications that will be tremendously helpful for you. The first is called Evaluating School Principles, a Legislative Approach. That was written by Sarah Shelton, and you can find it on our website at that link. And then there's another publication called Districts Matter, Cultivating the Principles Urban Schools Need. And that was produced by the Wallace Foundation in 2013. And we have a link there to that publication as well. Thank you very much. And again, be sure to contact Sarah if you have any questions about anything that was discussed today. This concludes the webinar. Thank you. This does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a great day.